And this is only this is just for tape recording. Just for tape recording. Welcome to the latest, uh, the first of this semester, Christian Perspectives in Science Seminar. And today, uh, today we have seminars in Christian Scholarship to thank for bringing our speaker here today and uh, hosting him. And our speaker today is Professor Carl Garberson, who uh, earned his bachelor's degree from Eastern Nazarene College and his master's and PhD in physics from Rice University. He has been a teacher and he has been a scholar and he has been interested in issues of science and theology uh, for quite some time. And uh, he's done a great deal of writing. Um, he's the author, uh, most recently, of the book, Saving Darwin, How a Christian Can, uh, How to Be a Christian and, Be let me start again. Saving Darwin, How to Be a Christian and Believe in Evolution. He's written several other books, and I will read uh, several other things he is currently doing. He is president of the BioLogos Foundation, a professor continuing at Eastern Nazarene College, director of the Forum of Faith and Science at Gordon College, and, and also editor-in-chief of the magazine Science and Religion Today. So please welcome Professor Carl Geiserson. Thank you, uh, Lauren, for that introduction. Uh, this is my uh, first visit to Calvin College, but uh, in a strange way, I kind of feel like it's a sort of a homecoming of sorts because for many years I've been involved with uh, faculty from uh, Calvin in various uh, projects. I've been uh, reading and corresponding with uh, Howard Van Til, whose uh, career trajectory uh, matches mine in many ways. I'm kind of like following along in the wake of the ruckus that he uh, created. Uh, I spent three summers with uh, Ari Leaguewater who I understand uh, is a chemistry professor emeritus here, I think now, uh, in Oxford University in a summer program. Good friends with Rebecca Fleetstra, one of your uh, distinguished alumni who teaches biology at uh, Point Loma Nazarene University. And uh, the Harzmas, of course, have uh, recently begun to uh, interact with the BioLogos Foundation and a few other projects uh, related to science and faith. and. Joel Carpenter, who invited me here. Thank you very much, Joel. Uh, so it's just great uh, to be here to Calvin on such a, uh, such a wonderful day, and so extraordinary to see so many people on Friday afternoon uh, out to here. You're here. You're an academic talk. I presume you're here because you want to be, not because you're getting some extra credit in a survey of freshman astronomy or something, uh, <coughs> uh, something like that. Uh, I want to talk a little bit, uh, in, a, in a somewhat personal way, about my own wrestling and thinking with the problem of uh, evolution from the perspective of being a Christian. Uh, it's a story which uh, I told in the book Saving Darwin, and uh, in, in this book I tried to weave together my own uh, story as I went from being a fundamentalist who wanted to be a crusader against uh, evolution uh, to now being someone who looks for ways to help Christians make peace with evolution and hopefully uh, come to accept it as uh, so many of us uh, have in the past uh, few decades as evidence has accumulated for it. My story, I think, is more or less the same story, kind of writ large, that we see in American culture, that this is a nation that is struggling with Darwinism. Uh, we have not made peace with Darwin. Uh, more than half of the people in the country, when polled, uh, still reject Darwin's uh, theory, uh, and many would like alternatives to it taught in the public schools, and there are many uh, people in positions of leadership who uh, have not made peace with with Darwinism at all and would like to see it go away. Uh, so that struggle is very much the struggle, I think, of many uh, evangelicals who have uh, gone through that trajectory in, uh, in their own life. My background is very humble. I was born in the suburbs of the middle of nowhere uh, in New Brunswick, uh, Canada, a little tiny village on the banks of the uh, St. John River. Uh, I thought everybody lived on a beautiful river when I was a kid growing up, and I've come to realize as I've moved away uh, what a wonderful uh, place it was to grow up. Uh, the St. John River is an extraordinary uh, body of water. The countryside looks like this. The majority of it is occupied by uh, potato farms, and every summer the potato crop would flourish, and in the fall, 
the schools would close for uh, two weeks, three if it rained, and all the school children would be dispatched to go and pick potatoes uh, for local farmers. Uh, if it rained so much that the crop didn't get harvested in time, then almost nobody would come back to school when classes were back in session because everybody worked on the potato harvest. It was very much a Bible Belt. Little small uh, churches dotted the landscape. Every community would have one Catholic church and four or five Protestant churches. Uh, each of the 15 or so members of these various Protestant churches would be sure that they were the only ones that had the gospel uh, exactly right, and they would argue with the 15 members of the little small church across the street on minor doctrinal uh, issues. Uh, everybody went to church. Everybody was a Christian. Uh, my father was a fundamentalist uh, Baptist uh, pastor uh, who pastored several churches that looked more or less uh, like this one. It was an interesting time to be a young Christian in the 1970s. Uh, it's amazing when we look back uh, and think about the changes that we've seen uh, just within evangelical Christianity. Uh, but this is something which uh, you can see in a museum perhaps today. This is a vinyl record uh, of the group uh, Love Song. This was the first Christian rock album ever produced, ever made. This, this was very, very controversial. It was kind of okay now for young Christian uh, teenagers uh, to listen to rock music because now we actually had an authentic uh, Christian group uh, singing rock music. This was very, very controversial, and uh, many of the uh, older generation were quite uh, concerned about these long-haired hippies uh, singing about Jesus. This was the time of the cross and the switchblade, which was made into... The volume up on the amp system? It's not an amplifier. Yeah. It's, it's only a recorder. Sorry. There is no amplification. Do you want me to try to talk a little louder? <laughs> I'll try. Maybe I'll stand up on the uh, riser here a little bit. Uh, this was a time when the cross and the switchblade was made into a major motion picture and there was interesting contact starting to appear between uh, popular culture and uh, Christianity. When the cross and the switchblade uh, showed up in the movie theaters, uh, it was very questionable whether we would be allowed to go and see it or not because we weren't supposed to go to movies, uh, but this was a Christian movie starring uh, Pat Boone, uh, so uh, most people thought it was okay, but I was a pastor's kid, supposed to be a good example, uh, and I didn't get to go and see the cross and the switchblade in the theater, uh, but I did see it eventually in the basement of a church. Uh, <laughs> The best-selling book in the decade of the 70s was Hal Lindsey's uh, Late Great Planet Earth, in which he predicted a great many things uh, based on his reading of the book of Revelation. Uh, none of them came true. Uh, surprisingly, the book, uh, unedited, is still uh, in print, and you can buy it, and uh, he makes new predictions every week on the Daystar Network uh, of more things that aren't coming uh, true. Uh, but... But this was a very exciting if you took this seriously because it gave you this idea that somehow as a Christian you had this privileged access to uh, the future, uh, or at least we uh, thought and hoped that we did. My interest was not so much in uh, Hal Lindsey as in the growing group of Christian apologists who were helping young Christians find the intellectual foundations for your faith. Uh, Josh McDowell's book, Evidence That Demands a Ber Verdict, was uh, widely read by uh, thoughtful Christian teenagers uh, in the 70s. Uh, Francis Schaeffer was emerging as a guru, and uh, people who could afford to take the pilgrimage to uh, Switzerland and sit at his feet uh, found that to be uh, deeply inspirational. And we studied uh, Francis Schaeffer in college uh, as well as in uh, Sunday school and high school. But I have to say that the most uh, influential uh, thinker uh, for me as a young person was Henry Morris. Uh, Henry Morris is the father of modern scientific creationism in this country, uh, a man who I think is, ha has been one of the most influential people of the last half century in shaping American culture. The, the, if you think about all of the uh, ruckus that has been created over evolution, he's responsible for uh, a great deal of that. So a very, very effective uh, educator and spokesperson for this viewpoint. I first encountered his work through this book, The Genesis Flood, which I read with great enthusiasm, big, massive 400-page book that combined uh, a scholarly study of the scriptures with 
uh, examination of ideas from astronomy and from uh, chemistry and geology.